Welcome everybody, I'm Lisa Thompson, uh, President and CEO of the American Chestnut Foundation, the best little conservation organization in the world, if I might say so myself. I'm um, very proud of our team and our collaborators. Two of our really treasured collaborators are here with us today. We're so excited to have Steve and Katie talk to us about Phytophthora, yet another disease that chestnut is very uh, vulnerable to. So we'll learn a lot about that today. Um, to uh, turn it over to Jared in a second, but just uh, wanted to go over a couple housekeeping details. It's being recorded. Everything you say, or, well, you won't be speaking, but everything you put in the chat or the Q&A um, will be uh, kept for posterity. So please keep your questions in the Q&A so we can um, archive and answer them. Um, as we as we hear them, we will wait until the end of the presentations to to actually answer those, and we'll have more of a conversation at that point. Um, if you just have a comment or just want to say hi, throw it in the chat, please. Um, but everybody else, just um, enjoy this this great uh, learning opportunity. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Jared, our director of science since 2015. Jared, take it away with the intros. Hey everyone. Um, so. For Phytophthora, we've been, you know, working since 1983 on introducing blight resistance into American chestnut populations, and Phytophthora was sort of one of these things that we rediscovered uh, as a problem with growing chestnuts as we were um, growing some orchards in like the south, and they started dying from this uh, root disease, and Steve got in on this uh, on the ground floor. Um, looking with our, one of our uh, longtime volunteers, Joe James, near Clemson University in like 2004, Steve, maybe? It was a long time ago. Yeah. 2003, yeah, and I'll talk about that. Yeah. And um, so ever since then, um, you know, we've been, Steve started screening trees for our hybrid trees, our backcross trees for phytophthora resistance in 2004 four or five at Joe James uh, farm chestnut return. And uh, so we have, you know, many, you know, many years of data now, 16, 17 years of data, 30,000 trees. I looked at the count that we've killed or not killed with Phytophthora. Um, and Katie, Katie has come along um, in 2019 as managing the um, re uh, resistance screening center with the US Forest Service. And she's um, really helped us like increase our efforts in screening. So with now we're screening like up to 6,000. Last year we screened 6,000 trees. That was like our record um, in one year. Uh, we're probably not gonna do that again. That was way too much, but um, it was, it's amazing the uh, amount of work, you know, to, we have this whole greenhouse dedicated now to um, screening seedlings uh, from trees in our breeding program to select parents that are resistant. Um, so Katie will talk about that. So Steve will give us the history and Katie will kind of um, bring up like where we're, where we're at now and scaling up the effort. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Let me get my screen up here. And panelists, if you would, um... Stop your videos while Steve's presenting. That might help any distraction. So is that uh, visible? Can Good. you see that screen? Yes. All right. Well, really welcome, good. welcome, folks, and glad you could join us today. It's my pleasure to work with Katie today on talking to you about Phytophthora cinnamomi and the American chestnut. I'm a professor here at Clemson, and Katie is a plant pathologist pathologist and director at the USDA uh, Forest Service Bent Creek Experimental Forest and the Resistant Screening Center up in Ash, Ash, Asheville. Uh, things we're going to cover today, I'm going to give you some background on phy phytophthoras as plant pathogens, um, how we got started in, as Jared said, rediscovered phytophthora root, root rot on American chestnut. And the initial screening efforts that Joe, Joe James and I did to screen hybrid chestnut seedlings early on. And then I'm going to turn it over to Katie, and she's going to tell you about the on, ongoing efforts to con, continue this screening and what they're doing up at the um, at, 
Asheville Re Resistance Screening Center, and that's a real a real good collaborative effort. Collaborative effort, pardon me, between the Forest Service, the American Chestnut Foundation, and Cle Clemson. So, the first thing I want to tell you is that Phytophthora species are really amazing as plant pathogens. They are a pretty unique group of microorganisms. And as a group, they're responsible for some of the most destructive diseases on a worldwide basis. Many of you may have heard of late, late, late blight on potato and tomato. That's the uh, disease that brought a lot of the Irish immigrants to the United States in 1840, killed over a million people. Uh, it causes black, black pod disease on cacao, one of the limiting production uh, issues on that uh, crop. Uh, causes a serious disease called black shank on tobacco. Uh, several diseases on citrus, gamosis, foot, foot rot that you see here, and brown, brown rot on citrus fruit. It causes root rot on soybeans, alfalfa, clover, and a number of our field, field crops. It also causes phyt, 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 phytophthora blight on a number of the cucurbits, like cu cucumber, melons, and squash. And lastly, one of the most uh, recent ones is it causes a disease called sudden oak, oak, oak death on tan oaks and oak, oak species on the California coast and southwestern or Oregon. So these are pretty no, notorious plant pathogens. To date, there's 170 species that have been identified and described <clears throat> because of the in interest in this group worldwide. There are uh, new, new species being described every, every year. They attack plants in all different cropping systems, fruits and vegetables, field crops, ornamental plants. Here's a picture of some camiciparus in a nursery with phytophthora root, root rot. They attack trees and forest and natural eco, ecosystems. These are bleeding cankers on a gor, gordonia tree on the uh, South Carolina coast, a uh, disease we've just rec recognized here at Clemson in the last year. And these pathogens, because of their diversity, are active in most cli climatic regions around the world. They're species that are adapted to tropical climates, to temperate climates, and even ones that are active in the al alpine or boreal cli climates. As I said, they cause some of the most eco economically important diseases on both herb herbaceous and perennial plants here in the United States and elsewhere around around the world. They cause problems in fields, in farms, nurseries, greenhouses, landscapes, and forests. They're particularly serious in or following wet, wet years. And these diseases are often associated with wet or saturated soils. This is a picture of a nursery up in Vir Virginia where TACF used to grow chestnut seedlings. You can see how wet the soil is and you can see those chestnut seedlings dying. And the reason they're associated with wet soils because they produce a swimming spore called a zoospore. And these things move in films of water. So first thing I wanna tell you about phy phytophthora as a group is they're not really fungi. We talk about them being fungi. Um, People that are old like me that grew up thinking they were fungi still refer to them as fungi, but but they're they're not true true fungi. They used to be called in older books uh, lower fungi or the phyco phycomycetes. We now like to call them fungus-like or organisms, or more appropriately, their group that they're in they're called the oomycetes. So phytophthora are really oomycetes. They're more closely related to plants than they are to fun, fungi. This is a, a stick figure of a phylo, phylogenetic tree on the right here. And you see the oomycetes are on a branch over, over here. Traditional or true land plants are up here. And fungi actually are more closely related to animals than they are to the oomycetes. So the other groups in the oomycetes are primitive algae like golden and brown algae. 
There's some cryptomonads that are aquatic uh, unicellular or organisms. Diatoms are also oomycetes. So this group produces some pretty unique structures, which makes them um, successful as or organisms. And one of the key char characters they produce are oospores that you see up in the top, top right here. These are thick-walled survival structures. They also produce a chlamydospore. You see down here, if you look at my cursor uh, in this center area, these are also thick-walled survival structures. They're less hardy than the oospores, but they still are able to survive extreme conditions. And then some of the most unique features are the sporangia, which are sac-like structures that you see here. These are fairly ephemeral or short-lived structures, but the unique thing about them is they produce these swimming spores we talked about called the zoospores. And zoospores are single-celled spores. They're little self-contained spores that are modal, or they move and they swim in films of water. And they're able to be attracted to wounded roots or roots that are stressed because they're in waterlogged soils. So these are the sporangia, these are the chlamydospores, and these are the oospores. So those are the unique features uh, morphological features that this group of organisms has. And the thing about sporangia is in films of water, they germinate to release zoospores. And here on the bottom left is a sporangium that's in the process of squirting out these zoospores in, in a film of water. And those zoospores will then swim away. Uh, they have fla flagella attached to them and they will swim and they are attracted to their host host plants. Here on the right, you see an in, intact sporangium. The area at the end dissolves and these little zoospores, here's a sporangium that's mostly empty. Uh, one zoospore trying to squeeze out and the last one waiting in line so it can get out and go find its uh, roots of the plant it would like to uh, uh, attack. So one thing that makes these things such a problem is they have pretty good survival mechanisms. And it's mostly the oospores and the chlamydospores that survive in soil, but they also survive fairly well in infected plants or in infested organic debris. On the right here, you see a picture. This is a site in southwestern Pennsylvania where TACF has put out a trial planting. And they've had a number of these plants die because somewhere along the line, Phytophthora cinnamomi got in introduced to this site and it has persisted even in the Southwest Pencil Pennsylvania climate. This is about as far North as we've been able to track Phytophthora cinnamomi, which causes Phytophthora root, root rot on chestnut. But it's persisted in that soil and survived quite, quite well. So the survival mechanism, zoospores and sporangia are pretty uh, short-lived uh, or uh, propagules. They can survive days, maybe a week in, in water. Uh, the pathogens can survive for months in con contaminated debris, plant, plant debris in or on the soil. But these chlamydospores and oospores can survive years. And we really don't know how long they're capable of of, of surviving. That's an experiment someone needs to do. But in infected tissue, when the plant is still living, they will live as long as the plant does. The big problem is once they get established in soil, it's nearly impossible to eradicate them, which is why we try and find sites where the pathogens aren't present. So one of the things we want to talk about today is Phytophthora root, root rot, and I call it the other disease killing American chestnut. Everybody's familiar with chestnut blight, but it's this kind of unique group at TACF that's been reintroduced to Phytophthora root, root, root rot on chestnuts. This disease was killing American um, 
was killing American chest, chestnut here in North America long before blight was in, in, introduced to this con continent. It was pri primarily active down here in the southeastern United States. There's undocumented reports of chestnut trees and chinkapin trees dying as early as 1825 in Georgia, and it was probably active long, long before that. There's also reports of un, uh, widespread death of chestnut and chinkapins throughout the Southeast since about 1850. And it was, a, it was in 1853 in Europe that this disease was first reported and claimed to be one of the most feared diseases attacking Euro, European chestnuts. And that disease in Europe was called ink, ink disease because of the dark color that the wood gets stained, the roots and the root, the root crown area get stained because of this in, infection. So it was the disease was first described in 1853 in Europe, but not really known in the United States yet. So the pathogen that causes this disease on American chestnut, as I said, is Phytophthora cinnamomi. It's probably the most a voracious Phytophthora species out there. It's got a host list of at least a thousand plant species and our Aus, 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 Australian colleagues think that that host list is over 5,000 species because it's very active in their native wild, wild lands. We think this organism was in, introduced to the United States in the late 1700s 1700s or early 1800s. We believe it originates in Southeast Asia. It was first, the species was first described and documented on cinnamon trees where it gets its name in Sumatra in about 1922. We believe it was introduced to North America through one of the shipping ports in the Southeastern United States when this country was being colon, colonized by Euro, 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 Europeans. So it was probably it introduced on plants that were brought from Southeast Asia to populate the plant, plantations that were being built here in the Southeast. So it's likely it came in through either Charleston, Savannah, or possibly Mo, Mobile, Alabama. But it came in, we think, on uh, naturally occurring on plants that were being brought in to be planted at southern plant plantations. But we know there was widespread death of chestnut trees and chinkapins at lower elevations throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s. The, first, the disease on chestnut was first diagnosed and con confirmed in the 1930s. There was a definitive re research paper published in 1945, but after that, there was very little re research done on this disease because all the chestnut trees were gone. They were dying here in the Southeast and then chestnut blight came in shortly thereafter and um, root, root rot took a back seat and people kind of forgot about that disease. Here's a map that was published in this 1945 paper by Crandall, Gravett, and Ryan down here in the bottom left. And it shows you the distribution of chestnut. Chestnut is the dotted, dotted line here that shows you the extent of that uh, plant species. Chinkapins are this dot dash line. Chinkapins occurred in this area. And Phytophthora cinnamomi are triangles that were found that were diagnosed and found in nurseries. Circles are Phytophthora cinnamomi isolated from chestnut and chinkapin. So you can see they were diagnosed in Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, and, and North Carolina. So those were uh, documented sightings or occurrences of Phytophthora root, root rot on chestnut, chestnut trees. So this was back in 1945. So after that, it was pretty much forgotten about until TACF decided to start planting out some of their hybrid uh, families in, in trial orchards. And we rediscovered this disease in about 2003. So for years, blight diverted everybody's attention away from root, 
root rot due to the seriousness of that disease and its widespread nature throughout the eastern forests. It was not until um, Joe James had a planting of uh, his plants on his farm in uh, Seneca, South Carolina. They all started dying and uh, through his connections with Clemson, he got in touch with me and we went out there and confirmed Phytophthora cinnamomi uh, was killing seedlings on his farm, uh, Chestnut Return Farm in uh, Seneca, South Carolina. And Joe and I started a collaboration, a little side project back in 2004 to start screening trees. Little did I know I would still be doing this uh, 18 years later. So here's some symptoms that we saw at his farm. This was a healthy seedling. Here's a disease seedling showing symptoms of wilting, uh, early symptoms of Phytophthora root, root rot on chestnut. You dig those plants up, you'll find out that they have rotted roots. There are no living roots left here. And that lesion right here is moving up into the lower stem. Here's an older seedling that was uh, killed. All these roots are rotted. And here's this lesion, the advancing edge of Phytophthora cinnamomi moving up the lower uh, stem of that seed seedling. Here's another tree, older tree wilted out in the field from root, root rot. And when you dig it up, here's the main stem. You can see the lesion coming up here. Here's my knife. Here's a little side shoot. You can see the uh, typical lesion of a Phytophthora canker moving up the stem of that seedling. Here's another plant, dead roots, and the lesion moving up the stem. So these are very diagnostic symptoms of this disease. So Joe and I decided to start a project to, to try and screen hybrid chestnut seedlings. And the goal was to develop a system to evaluate for resistance that would kind of mimic what's happening out in the field. We didn't want to artificially uh, wound these plants and inoculate them. And the overall goal that we had was to create a resistant population of trees that could be used for breeding efforts down the road. We didn't know if hybrid trees had resistance. We knew that Chinese chestnut that was resistant to blight that was being used to create hybrids was also resistant to Phytophthora cinnamomi. And there was just a hope that some of those genes that were carried into the hybrids for blight resistance may also be uh, offer resistance to Phytophthora cinnamomi. So the research we started was really a collaboration between Joe and Chestnut Return Farm, where we did all the work for many years. Paul Sisko got involved, uh, Jared's pre pre predecessor at TA TACF. And we had a number of other people that helped out along the way. For most of this research, all the, uh, the, the families that we tested were provided by TACF and they were back crosses anywhere from simple F F1s all the way to BC4s. We always planted Americans as a susceptible control and a Chinese as a resistant con control in all of our annual experiments. And I'm going to quickly walk you through what we did. We did this research in 150 gallon uh, tubs. These are watering tubs for livestock filled with a, a soilless potting mix. Um, Joe would string string across there to indicate rows. TACF would provide seeds. We would germinate, or pardon me, stratify those seeds in a cold, moist peat moss and let them germinate. And then they get planted in rows in between Joe's strings. We plant them very close because we know that most of them will probably die. And in the end, we end up with a tub like that with colored markers that indicate the start and stop of each of the families. And then we had multiple tubs. We started with two, we went to six, and I don't know how many were uh, finally out there, I've lost count, but we had at least 15 or 16 tubs. Once the trees were up and growing, uh, usually we planted in April, um, come early, uh, mid-June, pardon me, or early July, we would inoculate the plants when they were up and fully growing. We grow the inoculum, we grow the phytophthora up on horticultural grade vermiculites uh, moistened with V8, V8, 
V8 juice. We thank Campbell Soup for that. We make a furrow between the trees. It's like kind of parting of the Red, Red Sea. It takes a few hands and we make a furrow between the trees. We sprinkle inoculum down, cover it up, water it in and let nature take its course. And about two to three weeks later, we see plants are dying. The susceptible, the real susceptible ones die very quickly and they grow through, would let them grow throughout the season. And sometime in mid or late December, after I was done with classes and all the plants were dormant, we assemble a crew together of people from my lab and TACF vol vol volunteers and anybody Joe could drum up to come out and help. It was a, a took lots of labor. We dig up each and every one of those seedlings and score the root system on a zero to three scale. This is a zero, that's a healthy healthy root, root system. A one was uh, any kind of a lesion on feeder, feeder root, so a little bit, um, a little, little bit of disease. A two was a lot of disease and usually it meant the tap root and most of the feeder roots were dead. Here you can see this whole tap, tap root is dead, but the plant is still alive and three were dead plants and they were pretty easy, easy to find. So after 14 years, as Jared mentioned, we did this screening from 2004 to 2017 at um, Joe's farm. Uh, we screened over 18,000 seedlings in 505 different hybrid families. Some of those families got screened in multiple years. The good news was that we were able to detect resistance in these hybrid families. That meant that genes for resistance to P. cinnamomi that had been present and selected for for uh, blight resistance were also offering. We'd also brought along some of those genes that offered resistance to P. cinnamomi. Uh, working with others and branching this project out, we were able through genetic analysis to confirm that uh, resistance was present in certain hybrid families and specific sources of resistance are being identified now. Jared's been playing a big role in that. We have collaborators at other u uh, universities. Now the effort is focused on breeding uh, for uh, root rot resistance. It's been moved up to um, up to Katie's con control at Ash Asheville at the Bent Creek Experimental Forest, and with that, I'm going to finish and stop sharing, and I'll let Katie take it over. Okay, thanks, Steve. Jared, do you have a moder moderator duty? Okay, so I'm just going to. Do have a few, there's a few questions in the, the chat and I just wanted to bring it up to Steve before we um, uh, move to Katie here. So these are these are questions I think you can answer, Steve. Um, so where does Phytophthora occur? Is it everywhere in the natural range of chestnut? This is from Frank. Uh, no, Frank, it's not in everywhere. It doesn't like cold and um, it's usually limited by the cold winter temperature. So the farthest north we've ever found cinnamomy, and it's not just on chestnut, other people are working on it with other systems, is, um, is really Southern Pencil, Pennsylvania. Anything north of there, there's never been cinnamomy naturally found. It has been, a, has been found in uh, cran, cranberry beds in New, New, New Jersey. Um, but it's mostly in more southern southern climates, and even then, it's not widespread. It's very sporadic in where it occur, where it uh, occurs, and it depends on where people have moved disease plants or in infested soil. Henry McNabb uh, from the Forest Service, he asks, I may have missed this point during a coffee refill. Is American chestnut susceptible to more than one species of Phytophthora? I didn't want to get into that, Henry, but that's a good, a good question. For about 80 years, Cinnamomy was the only species found associated with chestnut here in the United States. In Europe, there were at least three species that have been identified. I had a graduate student several years ago look at this, and we have 
several other Phytophthora species that will also cause root, root rot on American chestnut, but they're not nearly as aggressive and virulent as Phytophthora cinnamomi. Eventually, we need to breed for resistance. Make sure the resistance we're getting is um, provides resistance to all, all the species. Yes, and uh, Russell Boyer asks, what kind of soil does root rot or Phytophthora cinnamomi like? Well, it's not so much what root root rot or the pathogen likes. Um, the soils that are tend to stay wet longer and stress the plants are the ones where we see disease more often. So uh, that's part of the reason it's a problem here in the southeast is because we have heavy clay soils. But you can find it up on mountain slopes where the soils are much more rich and um, have less less clay. And Jared, can I suggest we be sure we give Katie plenty of time and then um, congregate to ask all the questions at the end of her talk? It sounds good. Okay. We'll move on to Katie. Yeah. And right. before we move on though, um, Russell Boyer is the future of chestnut restoration. He's um, got a perfect attendance of chestnut chat and he's eight years old. Thanks for coming, Russell, yet again. Take it away, Katie. Take it away, Katie. Sorry, my <clears throat> desk phone just started ringing, so I hung it up. Let me share my screen. And Steve, if you would mute and stop your video, please, that'd be great. Oh, yes, you bet. Do you guys see my title slide? Looking good, Katie. Okay, outstanding. Let me just move my panel. There we are. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jared. Uh, and good afternoon, all. Thanks for inviting me for this chestnut chat. My name is Katie McKeever. I am a plant pathologist with the Forest Service. And I also serve as director of the Resistance Screening Center here in Asheville, North Carolina. And we work with the American Chestnut Foundation, which I will also abbreviate to TACF occasionally, to screen hybrid seedlings for resistance to Phytophthora cinnamomi. So just a bit of background on the Resistance Screening Center, or I'll also call that the RSC. We're located on an administrative site in the Bent Creek Experimental Forest, and we're right on the southwest side of Asheville. This site was established in 1925, actually as the Appalachian Forest Experiment Station. And in 1971, the Resistance Screening Center was added to the north end of the station, mainly to cater to tree improvement efforts. Predominantly for the Southern Pines, uh, mostly in response to fusiform rust, which is a gall forming fungal disease. Over time, programs have expanded to include screening for other diseases here. Uh, throughout the history of the RSC, we've screened for pitch canker resistance in pines, dogwood and thracnose, uh, butternut canker, brown spot needle blight in pines, and chestnut blight. So in 2016, we began partnering with TACF also to screen some of the blight resistance selections for resistance to Phytophthora. So that's the little story I'll tell today. So that first year, 2016, was largely a pilot study uh, because we needed to figure out the best methods for how to conduct these large scale root inoculations but we also needed to construct a setup that allowed us to comply with an APHIS permit. Uh, APHIS is the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and this is a regulatory body of USDA, which you are all probably familiar with at this point. Uh, and they issue a permit to us to allow us to work with cinnamomy because it's a non-native Phytophthora. So under this permit, we are required to contain the pathogen. So we have a specialized greenhouse setup with bins that hold plants and water. And this allows us to comply with the restrictions of that permit. So I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail a little later. In 2017, we constructed eight containment bins uh, and we conducted a small screening in that year to test out the setup and methods. 
in 2018, that system was working well. So we increased the size of the setup to have 16 bins ready for screening in that year. And we also worked throughout the season to construct eight more bins. So we currently have up to 24 bins capacity in that greenhouse. In 2019 and 2020, we had those 16 bins again dedicated to the operational or, or standard screening that is with a single isolate of Phytophthora cinnamomy. But then we also dedicated those eight remaining bins to a cooperative study with Steve's lab at Clemson uh, to test different isolate combinations of cinnamomy for potential differences in virulence or, or pathogenicity. Uh, 2021, this past year, we filled all 24 bins with the standard operational screening. So we had more than 110 families this year, uh, and the, the screening ultimately ended up being more than 4,000 seedlings, almost 5,000 seedlings. So when I say uh, standard or, or operational screening, this is utilizing a collection of potentially blight tolerant hybrid seedlings from the breeding program and exposing those trees to a single isolate of Phytophthora cinnamomy in a randomized complete block design. The experiment runs for about 18 to 20 weeks. Throughout the experiment, we record dead seedlings weekly. And at the end of that 18 weeks, we assess the severity of rot on the root systems of anything that's left surviving. So survivors that have a relatively low amount of rot on the root systems are outplanted at a predetermined field site to assess survival over the long term. So TACF and Steve's lab do a lot of legwork each year leading up to the experiment to identify this field site where the greenhouse screened or, or pre-screened trees will ultimately go. And they actually source the isolate that we use in the greenhouse experiment from that field site. Steve processes soil samples and he sends me nice clean cultures that I can use to develop inoculum. So in, in this way, it's an effort to not spread different genetics of Phytophthora cinnamomy around the Southeast when we move these trees from the greenhouse out to the field. As I mentioned earlier in 2019 and 2020, two consecutive years, the RSC also partnered with Steve at Clemson on a concurrently running experiment to test different isolate combinations to see if there are differences in pathogenicity. So this table here shows eight different treatments that were applied. And these are isolates that came from different substrates or hosts or locations. And this study was actually a follow-up to a project that was done by a former graduate student of Steve's where five of these same treatments were applied broadly to American chestnut. Now, American is so susceptible that in that experiment, all the trees died and few differences in isolates could then, be, could then be observed. So by using some of the hybrid seedlings that as we know have been bred with the more Phytophthora tolerant Chinese chestnut, the goal was to gain a little bit more resolution on isolate differences. So this chestnut project, this cooperative project we have with TACF is just super fun for the RSE. Each February, we get to invite a whole group of chestnut enthusiasts that come help us plant, as Jared said, upwards of 6,000 seedlings for screening. Our volunteers come largely from the Carolinas and Georgia TACF chapters. I know many of you are watching today. Uh, and we do have local Asheville TACF folks. You'll see Lisa and Jared in some of these photos. And we also do have uh, volunteers that come from local colleges, including Montreat College and Warren Wilson College. And we spend the day filling thousands of cones with soil, planting all of those seed, and getting those trees up into the greenhouse. So it's pretty cool. What I've come to realize is that this project can help serve as sort of a conduit to introduce folks that may be familiar with the breeding program, but may not know much about the Phytophthora program. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for us to uh, work with the general public. So a lot of folks don't know that the Forest Service is sitting here on the southwest side of Asheville. We're right next to the Arboretum. Uh, we're not the NC Forest Service. We're, we're the Federal Forest Service. Uh, and what we do. 
So it, it's a pretty cool opportunity for us also to interact with the public. Uh, last year, actually, the, the local news channel came out and did a highlight of the project on planting day in late February. So at the end of my presentation, I've included that link so you can check it out if you're interested. We can maybe even email it out because it's kind of long. So after planting, the trees germinate pretty quickly. About two to four weeks, we have something that looks like that top middle photo. Uh, and next there are a series of steps to actually structure the experiment before we even inoculate. So these include things like inventorying what germinated and what didn't germinate and getting all that non-germinated stuff out of the greenhouse, uh, printing tags with unique barcode IDs and those barcodes correspond to the family as well as the tub location. Uh, and this is done largely by Eric Jenkins at Meadowview. He prints the tags and mails them to the RSC. Then we have to tag each individual seedling with the pull through tags and then randomize those trees into the various bins around the greenhouse. So it's a, a pretty good amount of work that goes in before we even inoculate. To develop the inoculum, we follow the protocol that Steve mentioned briefly uh, and was developed by Steve. So this includes mixing fine vermiculite with V8 vegetable juice, and that V8 juice adds nutrition to the vermiculite, makes it a good nutritional base. So we sterilize that mixture in mushroom spawn bags, and then we drop chunks of actively growing phytophthora cultures from auger plates right into those bags, and we kind of mush that around by kneading the bags every couple of days. In about 14 days, that vermiculite is fully colonized, and it's ready to go. It's ready to infect. This uh, substrate method is great. Uh, it can be produced in large quantities. Uh, it can be applied really easily and it can be applied really uniformly to large numbers of trees, thousands of trees. We apply the inoculum by spooning it right onto the top of the soil in each seedling cone. We set the greenhouse up to be sort of a production line of inoculation. Uh, usually in, in non-COVID years, this is again a big volunteer day. Uh, so we've got folks that load seedlings up from the bins onto carts, they push them down to the inoculation station, spoon in that vermiculite. We actually top the vermiculite off with sand to keep it in place. Uh, we water it in and then we get the trees back into their bins fully inoculated. So the specialized greenhouse bin setup that I've, I've mentioned a few times. This setup again was constructed to allow us to collect Phytophthora infested water and treat it before disposal to comply with APHIS permit regulations. But also since Phytophthora, as Steve mentioned, is a water loving pathogen, and in fact it thrives in field conditions where there are compacted soils, poor drainage and thus standing water, we actually flood the trees three times per week in these bins and that favors disease. It facilitates that zoospore release and movement uh, and it also stresses the host roots. So this flooding, we call it sub-irrigation. It's a uh, system we have set up involves plastic bins. The racks of trees sit in the bins on benches. Uh, the bins are drained via PVC lines that are powered by pumps that help move the water toward collection tanks. Uh, there are a series of cutoff valves and there are actually alternate direction PVC lines that allow us to redirect water from collection tanks back into the bins. So we can recirculate and thus conserve water throughout that watering week. because it's quite, it's quite a large volume of water that we use. Um, at the end of each week, usually on Fridays, we drain all the tanks, uh, all the bins directly into the collection tanks, and then we add bleach right to those tanks to kill the Phytophthora. We use analytic test strips that give us threshold readings of free and total chlorine so that we know we've added enough bleach to kill the Phytophthora. And then we can let that bleachy water just kind of sit in the tanks and gas off over the weekend in the heat of the greenhouse and then we can release it into the environment. Here it is. As Steve also mentioned, about two weeks post inoculation, we begin to see mortality. So chestnut is extraordinarily susceptible to Phytophthora, unfortunately. We get this characteristic wilt 
uh, the drooping of the leaves. And then they turn brown and just kind of give up the ghost, just like we saw in those field pictures. If you unpot these trees, the roots are just decimated. There's really nothing left to them. We get the characteristic lesions that extend up the stem that help us verify Phytophthora. But we also isolate the pathogen from a subset of seedlings in each bin to verify that P. cinnamomy is present and that it's responsible for the symptoms. We perform two types of assessments. So throughout the course of the 18 week experiment, we go in weekly to record dead seedlings and we physically remove them from the experiment. So we cull them out, bag them up and get rid of them. The weekly observations gives us an idea of mortality over time or how quickly disease is progressing uh, and how quickly certain families are succumbing to disease. At about four months post inoculation or whenever mortality starts to wane, we break down the experiment and we collect data on everything that is left surviving. So this involves unpotting all of the rem remaining surviving seedlings. And in some cases that's uh, still a thousand or so seedlings. We bag up all of the soil and then we wash the soil from the roots and buckets of water. Uh, in this way, we can observe and rate the extent of rot on the root systems. The visual ratings are based also on the remaining root structure and extent of rot, like Steve mentioned. Data are recorded by first scanning the barcode ID on the tag, and then scanning a barcode that corresponds to the assigned numerical rating on that zero to three scale, same thing that Steve is doing out in the field. A zero, again, healthy, the roots look pretty good, no evidence of lesion development. A one, there are still fine feeder roots and the rot is limited largely to those fine roots with very little on the main tap root. A two, the feeder roots are largely consumed and that rot extends onto the tap root as Steve showed. And a three, they're toast. The root system's totally rotted. Uh, it's amazing that these trees are still alive above ground, but they are. Um, but this severity rating allows us to assess the quality of the surviving seedlings. And that helps us draw conclusions about the hybrid families overall. So since my portion of the project is mainly utilitarian, uh, I'm facilitating and implementing the work. The data I present here are not necessarily showing the greater conclusions regarding heritability or good familial crosses. Uh, maybe uh, Jared will give another chestnut chat for some insight into that information. But rather what I can show you is how disease progressed over time in different years with different hybrid selections and isolates of Phytophthora. So this figure here are 2020 data uh, and the Cinnamomy isolate here was sourced from Georgia. Along that horizontal axis, we have the number of weeks post inoculation. Vertical axis is the count of trees that have died at each observation day. This year, there were approximately 2,500 seedlings and they were in 16 of those bins. Um, just like Steve's uh, work with Joe James, about two to three weeks post inoculation, there's a big reliable initial spike of mortality. Those super susceptible seedlings are dying off. And this year we had more than 400 dead per week at that uh, two week point. And then there's a steady decline over time until we get low weekly mortality, you know, 10, 12 seedlings dying per week. And that signals that the experiment has run its course, the most susceptible trees have died off and it's maybe a good time to break it down and take assessments. 2021, it was a little different. We used a different isolate of Phytophthora cinnamomy. This one was sourced from Maryland. Uh, and in addition to a core set of overlapping seedlings between 2020 and 2021, we did have more unique crosses of hybrid seedlings, including a few families that have shown pretty good resistance in other trials. Uh, we also had nearly twice as many trees and they were distributed across all 24 bins in the greenhouse, so spatially a little different. So the curve looks a little bit different this past year. We do see that initial spike again, two to three weeks post inoculation but then a little bit more noise. We had less uniformity in the number of trees dying each week. We had some quiet weeks and then a big burst of uh, mortality and then another quiet week. But overall, still that general trend toward fewer trees dying uh, each week and, and the experiment is uh, progressing, signaling the end. 
This figure again shows data from 2020. Uh, here we're summarizing the frequency of seedlings in each visual root rot rating category. So on that X axis are the categories 0, 1, 2, 3, vertical axis number of trees in each. In 2020, we had a predominance of twos. And those are those seedlings that are largely devoid of the feeder roots and have lesions on the tap root. So we were getting a lot of trees with pretty significant lesions, even though they were still alive above ground. We had fewer ones that year, and many of those ones are the ones that were outplanted to the Austin Flint Northridge site. There were no seedlings deemed healthy in 2020, no zeros, despite having Chinese chestnut negative controls. So even they suffered some measure of root rot that year. Uh, the threes, each year we have very few seedlings that get rated as a three because they're just so rotted that they're, uh, for the most part, have already died out and been culled out of the experiment. So we characteristically don't have many of those. If we look at 2021, uh, we had a slightly greater proportion of ones here, uh, as well as a few we were even compelled to call zeros. So some of these trees just looked really good. They looked pretty healthy even after 18 weeks of exposure. So although the experiment again differed in a few ways operationally from 2020, more, more families, more seedlings, uh, and thus seedlings were more densely packed in the bins. They were distributed across the entire greenhouse. We also sort of developed a loose hypothesis that perhaps the 2020 isolate from Georgia may be slightly more virulent than the Maryland isolate this past year. So a discussion of the results from the isolate virulence comparison experiment is timely here. Remember, we had those eight treatments, different cinnamomy isolate combinations from different states, hosts, and host tissues. And if we look at the number of seedlings killed by each isolate treatment, we were able to see some ranking of the various isolates. So for example, Azalea Roto isolate came out on top both years. And we do see some other differences in isolates. I'll say these are anecdotal differences. Uh, so these are not analyzed data. So significance of these differences is, is undetermined at this point, but it is good that we're actually able to see some separation of the different isolates using these hybrid seedlings. And what's important to note here is that it does appear that locality or host adapt adaptation of the pathogen may play a role in, in our host phenotyping and in the, the reactions of the host. If we look at the frequency of seedlings in each of those three rot rating categories, so this time the 0, 1, 2, 3 are on the vertical axis, we do indeed see that using different isolates resulted in different severities of rot, even though we use the same collection of chestnut families in each of those treatment bins. So this is further illustrating the potential differences in, in isolate virulence. I'll point out here this bottom bar that's showing a bunch of zeros. That's because we had a non-inoculated control bin, so don't get too excited. We don't have like a amazing chestnut <laughs> hybrid seedling, unfortunately, yet. But what we're doing potentially each year in the operational screening, by replicating at least a core set of hybrid seedlings and exposing them to isolates that are sourced from different farms and different states, we may actually be capturing some of that variation uh, and thus developing a picture of, of how these seedlings may perform in different climate zones and pathogen communities. So information like this that we are gathering could certainly help in the effort to identify cinnamomy resistance that could be robust across the range of chestnut. It's much like how common garden trials operate and inform about trait expression in different environments. So again, the end game here, those seedlings that are the best of the best with rot severity ratings of ones or zeros, they're outplanted at those pre-selected cooperating planting sites for further assessment. In 2020, they went to Austin Flint Northridge in Georgia. And in 2021, they went to the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center in Maryland. So this is an important step. Because as we know, the environment that a seedling in is in has a real bearing on the expression of a given trait, like resistance. So inputs that may affect how resistant a tree is out in the real world include things like temperature extremes, soil moisture and quality, sunlight availability, competition. Uh, and of course, 
natural real life phytophthora inoculum loads. So in the greenhouse, we're giving the trees near ideal growing conditions and we're loading them up with high levels of phytophthora and water. So it's a very artificial environment. Out in the field, they're getting exposed to natural conditions. So we get a chance to see how these seedlings are really doing. Uh, furthermore, since the ultimate goal for this screening project is to potentially identify and develop trees that are resistant to both Phytophthora and blight, having these trees out in the field also exposed to blight may help us find individuals that, that might be good candidates for the breeding program going forth. So that's a summary of the cooperative Phytophthora projects that we've got going on at the RSC. It's going really well. Each year we're narrowing down the number of families that we'll employ in the screening projects. We're contributing material to the field for testing. We're getting more information again on isolate performance and virulence of Phytophthora on hybrid seedlings. And just a huge thanks to all the cooperators and volunteers that come and help us every step of the way with some pretty uh, monumental efforts occasionally. So the RSC, we're just three people. So I am not underestimating when I say that we could not do this without you. So thank you for all of your help. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. We really love this project and we are already looking forward to 2022. And there's that link down at the bottom of the screen here, uh, WLOS.com. Local scientists, volunteers work to restore the American chestnut. So check it out. Wonderful talk, Katie and Steve. Thank you so much. This is, I've learned a lot. I know it takes a village to handle all these <laughs> terrible pathogens that are affecting our beloved tree. Um, so with that, I've taken Jared off the hook of reading the, the we have eight questions in the Q&A and some kudos in the chat. So if we can get the Q&A started, Jared might have some contributions. So I'll, I'll facilitate those. So if you um, wanna answer it, go right away. Um, Frank is very curious. Hi, Frank. Um, first about cold, how cold is cold? And you said cold stops Phytophthora. Can you quantify how much cold is required? Is an annual minimum or must temperature be below a certain minimum for an extended time? Uh, panelists? Well, cold is, uh, is a rel relative term and it depends on if you're getting a chronic or an acute exposure like any kind of a toxic substance you would have. And usually for cold temperature, it's um, how cold it gets for what period of time. And so you, Phytophthora cinnamomi will die very quickly if it gets exposed to freezing temperatures for a short period of time. Um, but it also will be uh, killed if it's held at lower temperatures, close to freezing for a long period of time. Um, there have been some studies done in the past at the amount of cold that it takes to kill Phytophthora cinnamomi. They've been published. Um, Mike Benson's lab at NC State did a lot of that, that work, but it's really how cold it gets for um, over what period of time. And you have to keep in mind that soil is a very well buffered substance as far as temperature goes. Um, the ambient temperature affects the top few centimeters or inches of soil uh, pretty dramatically, but you start getting six to 12 inches below the surface and temperature doesn't change much. So that's why we don't see cinnamomi at uh, higher elevations and northern climates where it gets cold and stays cold. But um, I guess I can't give you an, an exact answer, Frank, to that. But I, you know, we look at, at the map of where cinnamomi is and we can kind of draw a line pretty, pretty clearly around south, uh, southern Pennsylvania that temperatures, natural temperatures above that range um, are not conducive to cinnamomi growth and development and per persistence. There are also some differences in adaptations of different phytophthoras. So cinnamomi, and correct me if I'm wrong, is regarded 
typically as a Phytophthora that thrives in warm soils. So when I was doing um, laboratory-based Phytophthora studies, the temperature that's kind of standard for incubation of cultures is about 20 degrees C, which is about room temperature, 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so. And some Phytophthora can thrive very well uh, in temperatures up to 35 C, which is pushing 90 degrees or so. So there's slightly different adaptations too, and Cinnamomy is, is more of a warm soil one. Yeah, I would qualify it as kind of a subtropical temperate uh, species that it likes warmer. It likes warmer weather, which is why it thrives down here in the south, southeast and why we don't see it up in the northeast. It's not because uh, it doesn't uh, exist in the northeast. It gets transported on ornamental plants and nursery plants all over the country. And they just don't uh, establish in those cooler climates. But it's very happy uh, to live down here in the southeastern United States. We don't find it in the very um, higher elevations in the southern Appalachian Mountains. But down here in the P Piedmont and the lower elevations, it uh, persists very, very well. And this is a, a related question as to um, where it's found. How deep in the ground does um, cinnamon we typically go? Oh, that's a real good question. And there's been very little research done on depth. And uh, we have a paper that we published a number of years ago looking at how far down we could find Phytophthora cinnamomi. Um, uh, we did work at Joe's, uh, Joe's farm off in his wooded areas, and we did work at uh, the Clemson Experimental Forest where there's naturally occurring populations. And I can't tell you what that measurement is off the top of my head, but it was down to about 18 inches uh, maybe 20, 20, 24 inches. And it may depend on how deep it goes, uh, how deep the roots go, because it's going to colonize the roots and follow the roots down. We're doing a similar study on another project where we're pulling soil cores in uh, lavender fields because there's a species of Phytophthora that attacks lav lav lavender. And that's one of the questions we have is how how deep does it get once it's been in, introduced? And we're taking soil cores down to uh, three, three feet and seeing where we can find it. Great, thank you. Um, just process check here, we're at 10 or 12.34. Panelists, I assume you can stay on until we can clear out these questions. There's about nine. Great, we have a lot of curious folks out there in the chestnut world. So um, here's a fun one from Pat Peterson. Hey, Pat, why V8 choose? <laughs> um, just re research over the years, we use different uh, nu nutrient media in labs uh, for growing different types of fungi and oomycetes. And someone discovered many years ago that V8 juice was a great food source for oomycetes, particularly Phytophthoras and Pythiums. And we actually make a V8 broth, which is a diluted V8 juice with that's buffered with calcium car carbonate, but they sporulate well, they grow well. It's just uh, luck of the draw. Other fungi like it too, but oomycetes do particularly well on a V8 based medium. For my graduate work, I actually colonized rice grains with different species of Phytophthoras. And the contamination potential of rice grain, even after two rounds of sterilization, is staggering. So one thing I've told Steve, this is the first time I've used the vermiculite method in production. And it's so much more forgiving in terms of fending off contamination. It's really the best method. <laughs> it's very good. Okay, great. Um, here's a couple of fungicide questions. Um, are chestnut trees only slash mostly susceptible during early years of growth? Could fungicides enable trees to be established or would mature trees be killed by fungus too? And let's see if there's another follow-up question on fungicides. So let's start with that one. Uh, we've been screening fungicides for, uh, there are a number of fungicides that are registered and labeled for use for Phytophthora diseases. And we've uh, screen the most common ones on uh, chestnut 
to see how good they are against Phytophthora root, root rot. Uh, we're due to um, finish up that study this, this year and get a replicated trial out. But chestnut, so there are ones that do work. Uh, using them in a natural environment is not practical. You can't treat all the trees in a forest situation. Uh, chestnut trees, as Katie mentioned, are extremely susceptible to Phytophthora cinnamomi. They're most susceptible when they're young, which is why we inoculate them then. But um, we have every, there's no reason to think that a mature tree that had been uh, in an area without cinnamomi, if you introduce cinnamomi to that area, I'm assuming it would, uh, it would take more time, but I don't doubt it would become in, infected and die because as Katie mentioned, uh, chestnut, particularly American chestnut, is extremely susceptible to this pathogen. Some, some woody plants, we have to flood them to get disease. Chestnuts, you don't need to do that. You don't need to flood them. It just in, enhances disease development and quickens the process. And a related, is there a root drench fundus, fungicide that will kill PC? Nothing's um, gonna, you know. nothing's gonna kill Phytophthora cinnamomi. Most of the, well, all the fungicides we have are actually, we call them fungistats and not fungicides, meaning they'll stop the growth of the pathogen while there's an effective dose present, but they won't kill the pathogen. As soon as that fungicide wear, weathers away, uh, gets diluted by watering and irrigation, that pathogen will keep, keep growing, but they're all, uh, for any kind of a root disease, those fungicides need to be applied as a soil drench. Great. Um, here's one from Eric. Hi, Eric. Um, in Europe, they have used Japanese chestnut for root rot resistance breeding. Have you used Japanese chestnut as a source of resistance in breeding? Um, that's a real good question. Yeah, the Europeans cross Japanese and European chestnut for their breeding. In the United States, we use American and Chinese. And my understanding is early on, when they were looking at uh, developing hybrids, they found that Castanea dentata was much more um, likely to cross with Chinese chestnut, Castanea melissima, where in Europe, the European chestnut was more com compatible with the Japanese chestnut. So it's, it's hard to get um, species that are different to cross pollinate, but American chestnut seems to be more receptive to um, Chinese chestnut and European chestnut is more receptive to Japanese chestnut. All the Asian species, as far as we know, have good resistance to Phytophthora cinnam cinnamomi. The North American and European species are susceptible. We, we screened a few this Japanese um, American hybrids this year um, and they have okay survival like you know 30 percent or something of the family lived. Um, so we do have those weird hybrids. We've made some crosses with uh, we had uh, a year where we screened uh, Castania henrii and we, they all lived. <laughs> they were very resistant. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a, another Asian species. That's another Asian species. So the Asian species are all resistant. And we, we have some Japanese sources of resistance, particularly in the North Carolina breeding program um, that we've screened. So they, they do have resistance. And I think some of them got planted this year. Yeah, it just depends on which, um, how com, com, compatible are the Asian species is with the non-Asian species, I think. Cool. All right. Um, here's a couple of transportation questions. Can phytophthora, can phytophthora be transported on the roots of chestnut seedlings? Frank asks. And Jim asks, does the use of non-soil potting mixes serve as a good starting medium, especially if you are planning to transport seedlings from nurseries to orchards? So two-part question there, panelists. I'm going to let Katie answer that because she's the one that's moving trees out of the RSC out to, out to nature. Yeah, uh, certainly, Phytophthora cinnamomi can be transported on the roots of trees that are infected. 
Um, so that's a big, when we work with under APHIS permits, there are a lot of precautions that we take in terms of double bagging ceilings and making sure that they, uh, we don't um, transfer soil that's clinging to the roots or infested roots. In terms of soilless medium, that's a good question. We, for, so I also screen pines here. <clears throat> and for our pines, we, uh, I'm not screening them for Phytophthora, but we do plant them in a soilless media mix. The chestnuts we plant in potting soil in the Fafford mix. Um, so in terms of a soilless medium, but potentially moisture management might help with uh, some Phytophthora issues, or at least with uh, getting the roots free of clinging soil before transport. But if those roots are infested with Phytophthora, you can assume that they are also colonized by hyphae and potentially um, spore development inside of root tissue. So there's still a, a phytosanitary risk, I would think. Uh, Steve did some pretty interesting root disinfestation trials with some different products to see if we could render previously infected seedlings clean. And I'll let Steve maybe summarize some of those efforts. Yeah, the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Once they're in the tissue, uh, there's a lot of disinfestants on the market like chlorine bleach and the agricultural chemicals of zero, zero tall SA20 that are quaternary ammonia products. They will sterilize the outside of the root. They'll clean the outside. But if there's an, an in, in infection and the pathogen has moved in the tissue, you're not going to be able to clean them up. And the big reason we use soilless media is for con consistency on an experimental basis that we can know we have the same product from experiment to experiment and year to year. And it's a, it's a, a very good uniform medium for doing this type of re research. Very good. Um, are there native species of Phytophthora? Ab absolutely, yes. There's all kinds of native species. We can go to any moving body of water in the Southeast or any place in the country, I think, and probably uh, find native species of Phytophthora, which is why they're discovering new species every year. Everybody's out looking for new Phytophtheras. Uh, most of them are not patho pathogens. Uh, they're just occurring in, in nature. But the other species that we have that, are, uh, uh, that can cause root, root rot on chestnut are ones that are naturally occurring here in this, in this region. Some of them are truly um, uh, native. Some of them are exotic species that we suspect were, were introduced a number of years ago just like cinnamomy. Yeah, that's very true. I, <clears throat> my graduate work uh, looked at Phytophthora resistance of true firs for, for trees that are in use in the Christmas tree industry. So I did sampling from um, Christmas tree production regions and Christmas tree farms. And there were upwards of 20 different species of Phytophthora that all caused a similar looking root disease on uh, Aedes species. Uh, and cinnamomy was detected for sure in soils, especially of course here in North Carolina, as well as in Christmas tree production regions in Northern California. Um, but the most, most of the species we recovered were native Phytophthoras, but pathogenic on Aedes at least. Yeah, that's one of the most effective ways of moving Phytophthora species around is on disease plants or on soil where the pathogen has become established. It's a tremendous problem in the woody plant uh, nursery business. We move Phytophthoras around all over the country and all over the world on symptomless, healthy looking plants where the soil is infested with these or organisms. It's a huge problem. Yeah. All right, a um, few more and then we'll wrap up by one. Um, Dennis asks or mentions that I have two chestnut trees that have been in the ground that I know is infected with P. cinnamomy for two years. They're both doing well. What are the chances that they are resistant? Well, I guess we need to ask Dennis where he got the trees and if they're hybrids or true Amer Americans. And um, 
if he thinks his soil is infested, uh, we would be glad to test it and document that for him. Yeah, if you could throw that in the chat, Dennis, that would be great. And we can hook you up with Steve and uh, see what we can find out. Um, Frank asks sort of a philosophical question about orchards versus um, the real world in the forest. How does planting trees in a field represent the real world forest that is basically a mono culture like a field of corn? In a real Eastern forest, there's a high degree of diversity and pure stands of any species that are relatively rare. How important is this to preventing transmission of disease in a healthy forest? Jared, do you wanna comment on that? That's a good question. Um, I think they're in the, one of the experiments we're gonna do in the future, I don't know if we can swing it this year, is to take soil from the forest and um, introduce Phytophthora cinnamomi to that soil that we know doesn't have Phytophthora cinnamomi in it for, but we're gonna bring it into greenhouse. So we're not actually introducing it in the environment and then grow chestnuts into that soil, the forest, which has a lot of microbes living in that soil that might be competitive with Phytophthora cinnamomi and reduce the disease severity and compare that to soil where it comes from a field. Um, maybe it's been, you know, agriculture or something. It doesn't have that same kind of uh, microbial diversity and see how the disease manifests in that soil versus in forest soils. I, I would speculate that in forest soils, like there's some buffering and, and, the, and there's some competition uh, that, that reduces the disease severity. Therefore, you don't see, why do you see millions of chestnuts living out in the forest now? Um, is it because Phytophthora isn't there? Or is it because Phytophthora is um, being outcompeted by other things in the soil? That's a, that's a, big, that's a big question. Yes, we know we can find Phytophthora cinnamomi in a lot of our um, southern Appalachian forests. We've done that work, and, and, and yet there are susceptible species growing in those soils, like native rhod rhod rhododendrons, uh, several pine species, that we can take those isolates out of that forest soil and put them in the greenhouse into a soilless medium and kill those same, same plants. So there does appear to be a lot of bio, bio, biological buffering that occurs in a forest soil, which is very nu nutrient rich and a lot of or organic matter that, as Jared says, uh, promotes biotic diversity. In agricultural settings too, you have a lot more of those site characteristics that contribute to disease, such as soil compaction and uh, poor drainage and maybe swales in the ground or water collects. So phytophthors are commonly problems in agricultural sites or areas that have a land use history as an agricultural site. And they've been shown to be not as good competitors in forest soils for a lot of the reasons that Steve and Jared mentioned. Good question. Here's a transgenic tree question. Is Darling 58 being tested? And as a follow-up, Jared, would you mind um, talking about the experiment that Tatiana is gonna be doing next year that was funded by uh, a very generous family. Okay, so we, this last couple of years, we started, after all these years of screening, we identified some um, hybrid parents that were like, let's say 80, they had inherited like 80% like of their genome from American chestnut, but they're resistant to Phytophthora. And we, we crossed those trees with the darling 58 trees to get kids that are resistant to both blight and Phytophthora. And this, this year we actually screened those trees and a few of them lived. Um, we did plant some of those trees out in the field and next year we'll be screening, you know, maybe like a thousand of those. Um, so we, we, we really ramped up that kind of effort to create trees that have resistance to both blight and Phytophthora. Now, when we do the, um, that first generation of breeding, the trees will inherit the blight resistance from dad and the Phytophthora resistance from mom. And their kids will be like partially resistant to Phytophthora. So we need to actually probably do another generation of breeding where we cross the Phytophthora, partially resistant 
trees together and select the kids that have really high resist levels of resistance to Phytophthora. So it might be kind of a two generation um, breeding plan to get really high levels of blight resistance and then also or a Phytophthora resistance and also have that OXO gene um, inherited from both parents. So then you can get all the seed that comes from those second generation will be resistant to both diseases. I believe in 2019, correct me if I'm wrong, we did screen a collection of Darling 58 that ESF brought to us. Uh, and I don't, I think they were straight Darlings, but you can definitely correct me if they were across. Um, they died swiftly and completely. So the OXO gene has no effect on phytophthora resistance. We need to correct. breed. So then the second, the, then this gets to Lisa's second question, which is, could we understand the particular genes that are involved in phytophthora resistance in Chinese chestnut and then use a genetic engineering technique to um, take the genes and insert them directly into American chestnut's genome? And so that's one of the things we're doing um, this year is looking at genes that are expressed in the roots of Chinese chestnut in response to phytophthora inoculation compared to American chestnut. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to identify some candidate genes that are involved in resistance that could enable like future biotech approaches to enhancing phytophthora resistance. So that's, you know, we have all, we've developed all these genomic resources to be able to do that work. Okay, hey, great. Well, we have just a couple more. Um, Glenn has a, uh, Glenn Kotnick, how, how are you doing, Glenn? Happy holidays. Um, he is the, uh, chapter president for the Indiana chapter. Um, I have a fine root rot. If I have a fine root rotted root, can I view organisms of Hytophthora microscopically? Where are they now ty taxonomically? Protista, protozoans, you might've missed the earlier part of Steve's talk that talked about that they're not fungi, they're other things. So Steve, take that question, please. Uh you can see them on the microscope, but they have to be stained and you have to have a fresh sample. So it's not easy to see without some kind of culturing. So if you could, just to get roots out, they're probably, you'll see lots of hyphae on there and they could be phytophthoras. They could be other, other types of fungi. If the roots are rotted, they'll be colonized by other kinds of or, organisms. So um, probably the simplest answer is no. Okay, Eric has another question. Does Phytophthora only enter the plant through the roots or can it enter through the crown and stem? Uh, that's a real good, good question. Um, the roots are the most likely entry points. Those little zoospores are pretty, um, they're not very hardy, they're not very ro ro robust. So it's likely they're entering through feeder roots that are, um, less less well developed and don't have uh, second secondary thickening on their tissues. Uh, if you have cracks in the bark or uh, wounds in larger roots and uh, other parts of the tree that's associated with the ground, yes, they can they can probably get in there. But it's most likely they're getting in on the on the more tender feeder roots and then they're moving up the plant. Uh, once they get in, the phytophthora's usually occur in the um, in the cam cambium tissue and the the phloem and bark. They don't get into the woody woody part of the tree. Great, thanks. And finally, one last question. Cynthia asks, can you suggest companion plants for planting with chestnuts that might help protect these protect from these path pathogens? Companion um, plants. None that I can I can think of. I'm not aware of any plant species that are inhibiting growth and development of the phy phytophthora species. So it's not like nema, nema, nematodes where you can grow marigolds or something else that have some kind of an inhibiting effect. Um, unless Katie has no something I don't know, I can't think of anything that would um, protect your plant. I'm just thinking of there's uh, some antagonistic fungi like trichodermas that have been tested and show some oh, antagonism yeah. to phytophthoras that I, I don't know if there are commercially available formulations of trichodermas. That oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a number of bio, bio control yeah. products on the market. Several of them have trichodermas. 
trichod trichodermis in them that you can try and uh, add to your soil that may help protect the roots. Uh, none of them are uh, exceptionally effective against the phytophthoras. We've tried them in various plant systems, not chestnut per se, but with other woody plants and other herbaceous plants. And um, if the inoculum level is there and the conducive conditions are present in the soil, the phytophthora phy phy will win every single time. Yeah, I think most of the efficacy of those products have been shown in vitro or in laboratory studies on petri plates and stuff like that. Correct. Okay, well, that does wrap it up. Our last chestnut chat for the year. Thank you so much, Katie and Steve. You are really, really important collaborators to us. And um, kudos to Joe James for bringing it to our attention long time ago and, and John French for continuing at the Austin Flint Orchard and all the folks out there that volunteer and make our work possible. Um, quick announcement, um, January 21st, uh, 2022, the topic is evolution of the Castanea genus with Taylor Perkins of University of Tennessee Chattanooga. That'll be an interesting one. And uh, shameless plug for our end of year um, uh, fundraising campaign. It's almost wrapping up. So if you've given, thank you so much. 95% of our revenue comes from private philanthropy. So thank you all for making our work possible. And to all the interested citizen scientists out there, happy holidays, everyone. Anything else for the good of the order panelists? Are we good? I think right. we're good. Thanks. Thanks for ha having us. And uh, yeah. again, happy hol holidays. Yeah, and it's an honor for me to be involved finally with these efforts. And thank you for inviting me to speak. And thanks for all your help here at the RSE too. That's great. Thank you all. Happy holidays and stay safe out there. Bye-bye now. Thank you.